Fabulous Tales and Fables ASAP by Owen T. Duggan Story 5 Good Landlord, Bad Tenants The Third Last Part It was less than a week later that the same man came knocking, the same man who had raced back to the city bearing bad news. It was the same door, too, and he remained mounted as he loudly knocked with the butt-end of a lance. Who dares intrude upon my kingdom? said the usurper of the estate, the Lion Man, the leader of the very bad tenants. The lance-bearing man, alone and without a crossbow this time, and looking up to the watch window nearest the entrance, boldly said, I'll tell you this, you brigand, that if you want to leave here living, you had better show a living hostage. Last chance to negotiate. But I kinda like it in here. And how could I suffer the shame of being seen in public with deformities like these? And he waved both forearms out the window. However... They were not deformed at all, as supposed. In fact, no longer were they the forelegs of a lion, because the enchantment that had reshaped them before was entirely worn off. Your arms are normal, said the lance man. I was told you had a hunchback and injured hands. You were deceiving us, pretending to be disabled. You're a liar, and you're a thief. Popping out of view, the brigand yelled, Wait right there, my good man. I'll be down in a second to let you in. Everything's fine. I was kidding. There's lots of hostages for you. Lots of good stuff is happening. You'd be surprised at the progress. The lance man would fall for no trick. Even before bolts and bars were slid, he was wheeling his ride around and kicking its haunches. Yeah! He commanded. The door swung open to release three ferocious, slobbering wolves, which charged as out of a racing gate. The enchantment that had switched them into human form before was completely worn off. The race was on. The horse needed little coaxing. It made full effort to work up a gallop. Even so, the escape was not working smoothly. The rider struggled to pull the horse in a particular direction, over a rise and towards a tree line, and the wolves were setting up to flank and redirect the steed, whose instincts told it to head for wide open ground. It was all the rider could do to force control. As one wolf ran the flank at each side, the third closed the gap at heel. The human, unable to wield the lance while facing away, and busy steering with the reins, did not even see the hind wolf leap and catch the wooden shaft for a moment. The rider tried to jerk the lance free, but his balance was upset and he lost grip of it. The horse slowed while the wolves completed a wide flanking pincer, and the rider fell off. The horse spun, reared, and flailed its hoofs at the one wolf as the other two, slow and confident, closed in. The one wolf leapt at the human's throat, drawing ruby-red blood, goring him the more he struggled. He had barely managed to get to his knees. The horse, thus far lucky to avoid such attention, was to be spared harm, as it turned out, because of what happened next. What happened was that before the two flanking wolves could kill the horse, a hail of arrows whizzed through the air from the tree line. The arrows felled one wolf, another volley felled the second, which yelped and contorted in pain. Archers approached, rising to full height and jogging lightly into new positions. Not merely a few emerged, but one dozen then another dozen, then a third. One wolf remained, thus far not targeted, because it was too near the horse and rider. 
the rider, grabbing air and bloody neck, toppled to the ground, helpless. The horse was stomping noisily side to side and in half circles, sweat flying and nostrils flaring. It kicked and reared once more, facing the wolf, eyes wide. But now came the wolf's turn to lose balance, reacting to the tight band of archers. It became confused, broke off its attack, looked for an escape. It chose to bolt back from where it had come. Too late. With a clear line of fire, the archer's arrows darted at their target, not as a volley this time, but each flying as soon as an archer was able to shoot. The arrow shafts, pins into a cushion, defeated the beast. Rushing in, the bowmen found that there was no hope in saving the lance man. As the lance man lie dying, one middle-aged man approached, not jogging like the swift young men, but striding. And this living man was wearing the most amazing and unusual blue and tan tunic. The Dying Man's Last Sight The tunic was of thick, shiny silk in a simple, sandy, yellow-white tint. Elbow length at the sides it reached, and mid-hip length at the legs. What caught the eye was that on the chest of it were embroidered a pair of birds. The birds were a peacock facing its mate, a peahen. The cock's plumes were pulled in tight, not splayed, and its neck was sewn in a greenish blue, in the sunlight vibrant and shifting hue. The counterpart, the hen, was done in a humble brown and gray, in an attitude of bowing or pecking. Truly the tunic was an impressive dying man's last sight, and the living man was the rightful lord of the estate, a man who had always aimed to be a truly good landlord. Reaching the horse, the landlord patted it, tried to calm it, while someone brought water. This afforded him a moment to reflect on how this man at his feet had escaped danger the one time, living to report the warning of treachery coming from within the vineyard, the call behind the walls that went, Demon Lair! And today he had volunteered to find out if there were any hostages who could be saved. Now he was dead. Three dozen is enough, said the landlord gravely, more than enough to clear the vineyard, though nowhere near enough to demonstrate my pain. His anger rose. It was time for a violent reckoning. <laughs>